everyone, welcome to Credential Up Houston. My name is Margaret Ford Fisher. A December 2020 survey that was published by the Recovery Village and medically reviewed by Stacy Henson shows that more people are using drugs and alcohol to cope with stress, boredom, and mental health issues as a result of the pandemic. Experts are saying that there is an expectation of a rise in substance abuse throughout the pandemic and increased rates of addiction afterwards due to the stress of isolation, boredom, decreased access to recovery resources, and unemployment. Joining us to discuss the high-level view from a Texas-based drug abuse and mental health organization is Ms. Kelly Webb, Vice President of Human Resources at the Cinecor Foundation. Ms. Webb, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Great. The pandemic has really caused disruptions in so many ways. How has it affected your organization and the numbers of individuals coming to you for help? Well, certainly um, we have actually seen an increase. Um, there were, unfortunately, a lot of other treatment programs uh, that when, when COVID first started hitting, we, there were so many unknowns in the beginning. Um, programs decreased their admissions or they closed their doors, um, some what they thought temporarily. Um, some ended up closing permanently because of the length of time. Um, and as things have started to open back up, um, our admissions really never slowed down for us. Uh, in fact, in the very beginning, our clients that were with us when things started shutting down, uh, their thought was, I don't want to leave. This is the cleanest place I know. Um, we already had infectious disease protocols in place. Uh, we cleaned several times a day in our facilities, and, and our goal was to increase those protocols, clean more frequently, and then we added additional screening protocols, uh, as well as taking temperature checks for our staff that were coming in every day. So re we really had to pivot very quickly um, in order to keep our inpatient programs going. Our outpatient programs went from um, in-person meetings in groups to telehealth in 72 hours. Um, so really, um, you know, excited about what our IT team was able to do to pivot and get those I IOP programs, outpatient programs, up and running in a very short time so we could continue to provide outpatient services. And that truly today is one of our fastest growing um, programs that we have is our outpatient due to the telehealth capability. Absolutely. And I noticed as well that you have outpatient services. Do you plan to open one here in Houston as well? We actually are. We, uh, we are actually adding outpatient counselors at our corporate office. So for the very first time at our corporate office, we will be providing services from that office. Um, but we are adding an additional three counselors right now. We've just hired one and we're adding two more. So I'd like to congratulate you because your company had already planned for potential disruptions and to be able to turn on a dime as you were, that's really quite commendable. But I'm wondering, are you seeing more of a demand for mental health challenges in particular or for drug and alcoholism abuse or a combination of the two? It truly is a combination of, of, of the two. And quite often, uh, even before the pandemic, these were co-occurring disorders. They, they occurred together a lot of times. Uh, the drug and alcohol use is to mask some of the things that are going on with the mental health issues. Um, and, and so it, we've truly seen an increase in usage um, as well as an increase in things like depression and anxiety more and more of our clients are coming in with higher usage um, of their drug of choice or alcohol, as well as um, increased occurrence of their depression and anxiety. So are you seeing more males, females, or adolescents than before? Currently, we, have, um, we actually have more males um, in our short stay programs. I think we have about a 65 to 45% split in our short stay detox programs. Um, in our long-term programs, it's about 85% male, about 15% female. Um, and our long-term programs are 18 to 24 months. Um, so they are inpatient for 18 to 24 months. So you truly, um, in order to commit that amount of time, you have probably been in your addiction a little bit longer to want to stay inpatient for 18 to 24 months. But during that time, we're able to assist them with, with getting their GED, um, if they don't have their high school education, 
Uh, we assist them with getting employment. Uh, we help them save. And before they can graduate our long-term program, they have to have a job, at least two months savings, a vehicle and a place to live. And only then can they graduate and go off and be successful. Our adolescent program is probably about the same mix of male to female, about 85% male and about 15% female. It's so interesting. I'd like to talk about the educational opportunities that are provided as well. And as I look at what you were saying earlier, you made reference to the different types of facilities that you have and the programs that you have, like the long-term adult residential facilities, detoxification uh, facility, the short-term adult residential outpatient services, and adolescent uh, residential also. So tell us about the eligibility for the prospective uh, clients to be admitted to one of those programs? We do offer a, what we call our full continuum of care. Uh, we like to say we are going to meet people where they are with whatever their need is from, from inpatient to outpatient, um, regardless of the need and, and regardless of the payer source as well. Uh, We're actually the largest contractor with the state for substance use services. And so those state funds that we have are to help those individuals who don't have resources to pay. Uh, we, we are CARP accredited. Um, so we do take insurance, Medicaid, self-pay. Uh, we like to say we're gonna meet the client where they are uh, with whatever payer source they may or may not have. So truly, um, I won't say it's regardless of what type of payer source they have, we are going to help them even if they don't. How high is the recidivism rate? Once you determine that they are now fully rehabbed, what is the recidivism of those former clients? Have you data mm -hmm. on that? Yes. So for our long-term program, you know, as, as you might um, expect, it sometimes takes a while to build up that addiction. Sometimes it can take a while to work through it um, and to get to the other side. For our long-term programs, uh, if the person graduates, which again, that's that 18 to 24 months, uh, we do follow-ups through five years. And at our five-year follow-ups, there's still an 87% success rate. Now, that's our long-term program. Um, to get through our long-term program, sometimes it may take people one, two, or even three times. Um, our, our dropout rate after the first 60 days um, in our long-term program is about 65, to, uh, our, our retention rate after 60 days is 65 to 70%. Um, so there is a higher dropout rate in that first 60 days. A lot of times people come in, they start feeling better, they think I've got this, and so I'm going to go back out into the world again. Um, and and unfortunately, we do have a recurrence of about 25 to 30 percent in our long-term program that do come back. A lot of them do come back second time um, and are able to fully complete the program. They get they got just um, enough information the first time to know it's time to come back for the second time. Hey, okay, well, we are going to take a break, and when we return, is what we would discuss how Senecor staffs positions to serve their clients and to provide the resources that the clients need. So please stay with us. Being prepared is a part of who you are, but it's especially important in the case of a disaster. Be informed about possible emergencies in your area. Make a plan that covers where you'll go in an emergency. Build a kit with the things you need to survive. There's no one more capable of planning for your situation than you. Start your plan today. Go to ready.gov slash my plan. I know kids worry about a lot of things. Getting enough food to eat shouldn't be one of them. Through a nationwide network of food banks, Feeding America serves virtually every community in the United States. See how you can help your community. Visit feedingamerica.org. Welcome to HTC. Let me teach you. Let me help you get college credits. Let me train you for a new career. Let me change your life. Come learn with us. HCC, for everyone, anytime, any way.
Welcome back to Credential Up Houston, our discussion with Ms. Kelly Webb, Vice President of Human Resources at Cinecor. Ms. Webb, thank you once again so much for joining us. This is very good information that I'm sure will be appealing to a number of our viewers. So we were talking earlier about the eligibility requirements and the funding support and so on, but I'm wondering about your staffing model and you referenced the rehab rate, recidivism rate. So obviously you have professionals there working with all of the clients in both your outpatient services that you render as well as your residential services. So what is that staffing model that you use at your centers and what are the factors that influence the staffing at the residential outpatient and detox facilities? I would say the main thing that we look for in staffing obviously is someone who has a passion for helping others. Um, it is um, unlike a hospital where people may not want to be there, but they know they need to be there. They know they need that surgery. Uh, sometimes people come to us and they think they need help. And then after seven days or, or maybe longer, they get to feeling a little bit better and they think they don't need help anymore. So they need that engaged, productive staff to really engage with the clients and keep them in recovery and help them on that road to sobriety. Um, for our staffing model, we are, of course, licensed by the state of Texas, and so there are certain staffing ratios that, that we uphold. Uh, we have licensed counselors in all of our programs. We have both substance use counselors, LCDCs, licensed chemical dependency counselors, um, interns, licensed professional counselors, or LPCs, um, licensed social workers, um, and then we also have staff such as our behavioral health technicians. Uh, we have our nursing staff in our detox programs. Um, and then we have our managerial staff to wrap support um, around all of our frontline staff as well. Um, and so for us with our staffing, we, we truly believe in growing from within. So we have a leadership development program. We have tuition reimbursement. We have CEU reimbursement. Um, our leadership development program uh, runs on a year long program and it is specifically designed to each individual. We want to know what their specific goals are, what are your career goals, and then we partner mentors with each of our staff members to help them get to that next level. Uh, we are very big on sharing articles and reading books. Um, we do strengths-based leadership assessments for all of our team members in our leadership development program and help them focus on how to lead from their place of strength. Um, and, and I would say, well, I know of our executive team, uh, three of our executive members started out as interns and grew with, with the foundation. And one of our executives actually started as a counselor in our Fort Worth facility. And so we are, we are firm believers in growing from within. Um, we know the battle with addiction is, is not going to end anytime soon. It may, it may change. Um, in some ways, but we are going to continue to grow to meet the needs in our communities. And so we need to develop those leaders to be able to do that. Congratulations. I mean, that cross training of staff and providing them with the opportunity to grow and to serve your organization, that's really commendable as well, primarily because they are familiar with the organization, with the clients, with the expectations, and then they're able to contribute even on a, a higher level to the organization. And I'm wondering about, you were referencing earlier some of the staffing uh, requirements, the regulatory requirements and so forth being funded by the state. But how, I'm wondering to what degree are the environmental factors and the organizational factors that might influence the staffing uh, at the facilities? Well, as far as um, environmental, I would say from a cultural perspective, uh, Cinecor, we really thrive on service to our clients. Um, our, our internal motto for our, our um, staff is called, called We Serve. Um, it's our We Serve motto, and you'll see that throughout, throughout the facility. Um, and it really encourages going above and beyond for our clients and doing it in a positive way, uh, doing it where if, if, if we provide a positive and work environment for our staff, then they're going to provide a positive, stable environment for our clients. And so that's the type of environment that we are trying to, basically trying to set up every single day, in addition to 
what I spoke about earlier is just professional development and continued growth. I think the only way you can achieve stability with your staff and for the clients is to provide that career path so people want to stay with you and do those things like tuition reimbursement um, and CEUs where it's constantly learning, constantly working on additional skills and bringing your best self to work every day because that's what our clients deserve. Um, and so it really, it, at the end of the day, it all comes back to the clients from an HR perspective. For me, it's all about our staff and our team and what we're trying to do for them. Of course it is. And I'm wondering too about some of the positions that are hard to fill, mm -hmm. perhaps with the cross training or with the in-house training of your personnel that you still might not be able to get the personnel that you need for some of those jobs that are really in high demand. So I'm wondering if you have positions that are open now that are really critical that you can just reach out to the general community to say, this is what we have that's open and we are recruiting broadly to get the qualified talent to support the clients in your organization. Certainly nurses, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Um, as you might imagine, nurses are in very high demand right now. And so um, really partnering with different schools, colleges, and universities who have those nursing programs um, and, and, and be that landing place for them where they can come and develop those skills, especially within our leadership development program and really try and take, help them go to the next level in their career. Uh, the other positions would be our clinicians. Of course, um, we, we hire a lot of clinicians every year as well as our behavioral health technicians. Those are our frontline. Um, and what we really like to do with our frontline staff is we like to get people who are maybe in school for their, their nursing degree or in school for their clinical degree. They can go ahead and start getting experience as a behavioral health technician. They can take a part-time job to work around their school schedule and then they, as they develop into that next position, we're going to have that available for them. So they're already familiar with our clients, uh, with our culture, and then they can move right on up to that next position. Very good. And so in the next segment, we're going to talk about education exclusively, touch on some of those points uh, that you mentioned, which also is something to be applauded uh, in the focus that you then place on training and then reaching out to other organizations to provide the talent that you need. But I have one lingering question also about the, the clients that you have in those residential facilities. I presume that for their family members who want to come visit them, do you have restricted hours? How do you, how do you operate that? Some might be interested in knowing the answer to that question. Absolutely. Uh, we do have specific days for visitation. Um, and so depending on the program, it may be a different day. I believe long-term, our long-term programs, it's on Sunday afternoons. I believe our short stay detox, it's on Saturdays. And then they have the ability to have phone calls and connection with their family throughout through the week. And then for our adolescents, we actually do family counseling with the adolescents and the parents. Well, we will take another break. And when we return, we will discuss education and how Cinecor helps to advance the education and training for residents at the Cinecor facilities and also virtually. So please stay with us. Today, I'm going to talk to you about physics. Come on in, girls. Let's go. This is the first rocket to get humans to Mars. Really tall. I'm a rocket structural engineer designing and building parts of the rocket. You are the generation that will be stepping foot on Mars. Do I have a group of astronauts on my hands? Yes. You can become a rocket scientist or whatever else you want to be. Roll over. Chance high five. All right. When you adopt a shelter pet, you discover all the things that make them unique. And your mother and... Her. I am totally a hot person. Right, guys? Thanks for being honest. They're a little bit of a lot of things, but they're all pure love. Adopt pure love at theshelterpetproject.org. The faculty at HCC represents the best of the city. They're committed to getting our students to their goals. HCC, 
for everyone, anytime, any way. Welcome back to Credential Up Houston. We are continuing our discussion with Ms. Kelly Webb, Vice President of Human Resources at Senecor. So Ms. Webb, this is really a very, very informative conversation for us to have to talk about Senecor, all of the services that you render for persons who are recovering or seeking to recover from mental health challenges, as well as from drug and alcohol abuse. And so as we focus on the education, not just of your clients, but also of your personnel, you made reference to all of the many options that you make available with continuing education for your employees. Some of them, I presume, also who want to work toward a certificate or a degree at a community college or a university, they can do that. But I'd like to begin by talking about the adolescents. What is available for the adolescents in the long-term residential facilities? So for our adolescents, we actually do a variety of things. We take them out and tour um, colleges and universities so they see what the next level of education will be like and have them meet with some of the professors. Uh, we, what we also do is we have career day and we bring different people in different levels of professionals and technicians and actually host a career day for our adolescents. And then we also, we teach responsibility within the facility, keeping up with their area, uh, the importance of cleanliness and understanding accountability. Accountability is a very um, big term for us in the adolescent program. Um, and you would be amazed how the adolescents um, some days they don't like the structure, but ultimately they gravitate towards it because they know it means safety. It means safety and security for them. Um, and so we really try and wrap a lot of different services around our adolescents. And then we also have mentors uh, with business partners in the communities as well, uh, where they work with those mentors once they return back home. In the facilities, if they're there for 18 months, let's say, uh, do they have the homeschooling type of educational opportunities with dual credit that could be provided by the community college that they can also get to earn credit uh, at your facility? Yes, our adults are in the long term, um, 18 to 24 months, and so they certainly have that opportunity. Our adolescents can stay with us up for up to 90 days, and okay. they we actually have, um, we actually have a partnership with HISD and we have teachers that come in and teach them, and then they also have the opportunity to credential up virtually um, as well and take some of those college courses. So we do a blended learning um, with our adolescents for the time that we have them as well. Well, that's great. I like that credential aspect yes. of it because that's really critically important for all of us. So thank you so much for that. And then with your adults, you made reference to the various levels of training. Are you looking for individuals who have certificates primarily or degrees, associate degrees and baccalaureate degrees? All of the above. Um, for our residents um, who are with us in our long-term program, um, if they come to us and they don't have their high school education, we help them get their GED. We may help them get some type of certificate for, uh, we do a lot of industry work around some of our facilities um, or go back to school if maybe they started um, in school and they didn't finish. So we get them back on that path to that secondary education. Um, and then for our staff, it, it is such a broad spectrum. We have everyone from, um, from high school education all the way up to master's and our, um, our clinical executive is a PhD. Um, and so it really, it takes, it takes all levels uh, to be able to provide the services that we provide to our clients, again, to meet them where they are. Um, and we do a lot of tuition reimbursement. Um, again, CEUs really mapping out where each person wants to go um, and then partnering them with a the mentor as well. So we have three tiers to our leadership development program. Tier one is called key staff. Tier two is called a lead manager and tier three is called special projects because they're normally helping us with acquisitions and things like that. Uh, tier one is mentored by tier two, a lead manager. They meet weekly to go over their goals, to work on their strengths-based leadership, 
to really talk about what's needed to get them front to the next level. If they're a counselor and they want to be a clinical manager, what's going to get them to that next step? If they're a clin clinical manager and they're being mentored by a facility director, what's that skill set? What's that gap? And how can we help them bridge that? Um, and so we may do that through a variety of ways. It may be um, courses through their tuition reimbursement. Uh, we do some external training passes. We go offsite for CEUs. And so there's a whole host of things that, that we do to ensure that there's continuous learning. We, we truly believe um, if, if you're not learning, if you're not growing, you're stagnating. Um, and quite honestly, with, with what we're doing to help save lives, we don't have time to stagnate. We've got to keep moving forward and keep pressing forward. That's absolutely right. So does the state compensate your facility, for example, for the success rates of your clients who also leave the center with a certificate or degree? They actually do not. They, they, um, they pay fee for service for us, which is uh, the services that we are paid to do are the treatment services. Everything that we do in regards to the GEDs and the college courses, I mean, those additional things for our clients, Cinecor is paying for that um, out of our other funding streams. Um, we do have multiple funding streams in addition to our state contracts. Um, and we, as a nonprofit, of course, want to put that right back into services for our clients. That's great. So based upon your wealth of experience, I'm wondering, what do you recommend that community colleges, public schools, private schools, churches, businesses do to lower the temperature and to mitigate the mental health challenges and the drug and alcohol abuse rates uh, at this time and also work closely with you and your organization to help more students who are enrolled or more adults who are enrolled to achieve success? As far as helping with, with substance use and the cycle of addiction, I would say an awareness and taking down the stigma, being willing to have open conversations, asking people how they're doing, not just once, but no, really, really, how are you doing? And pause and give people a chance to answer. Um, and so having those open conversations, if you do know of someone um, who is struggling, offering help, offering, I know of a place, whether it's Cinecor or some other place that you might be willing to offer, um, just take down the judgment and take down the stigma. So many people are struggling at this time. And if we can have one conversation and have one person and get them to the level of care that they need, that's going to be a great day. You've been able to help that one person. So at the end of the day, it's truly about listening and understanding and being able to to have a resource to go to, to offer that help. Excellent. And so is there contact information for Cinecor? The best way to reach us is www.cinecor.org. You will find a whole host of information there, including a phone number that you can click on. It will take you directly to our access center and get you admissions uh, for which, whichever level of care you need. Excellent, Ms. Kelly Webb. Thank you very much for joining us. And we wish you and Cinecor continued success in helping your clients conquer the addiction and mental health challenges that so many individuals are experiencing at this time. You've been a great guest, great information. And to our viewers, thank you also for watching. If you know anyone who would like to credential up for a great career, please direct them to hccs.edu forward slash now and also take a look at the website that Ms. Webb provided. Well, this has been Credential Up Houston. We thank you so much once again for joining us, and we'll see you again next time.